This might be old news for some of you, but the newer generations have no clue what it was like to owe Columbia House money for CDs. In this video, I'll provide a brief overview of Columbia House, highlighting some of the questionable tactics employed by both Columbia House and its consumers against one another. Let's get to it. Between the mid-1950s and the end of the 20th century, acquiring music without cost typically involved the simple act of taping a penny to a card and sending it through the mail. This would secure 12 records or 8 CDs for the sender, opening membership in a record club with a commitment to future purchases. The appeal of joining a record club was its simplicity. With minimal upfront investment and a quick sign-up process, members could select albums that would then be delivered directly to their homes. By 1963, Columbia House had emerged as the leading entity in this industry, boasting shipments of 24 million records. By 1994, their distribution numbers soared beyond a billion records, making up 15% of all CD sales and marking Columbia House as a $500 million annual enterprise. This success supported thousands of jobs at its manufacturing and shipping plant in Terre Haute, Indiana. However, the fine print of these club memberships often went unnoticed, binding customers to purchase monthly selections at really high prices, including steep shipping fees. Additionally, some consumers exploited the system by creating multiple accounts under false names to continually benefit from the introductory offer of 12 records for a penny. This practice not only familiarized several generations with collection agencies, but also introduced them to the concept of music piracy long before the digital era. I guess many people want something for nothing if they think they can get away with it. Now, Columbia House was ahead of its time, in my opinion, pioneering the subscription service model we're all familiar with today. Way before Spotify, Netflix, and others learned how <laughs> easy it was to take our money. Shut up and take my money! Columbia House's practices, from the sneaky billing to the tough cancellation process and beyond, not only caused frustration amongst customers, but also sparked significant ethical concerns. It's a classic case of a revolutionary idea hampered by questionable execution, leaving us with a lot to ponder about transparency and fairness in the subscription world. Now, this whole scenario wasn't exactly a novel concept for mail order services, but it definitely caught the most eyes because who wouldn't want eight or 12 CDs or whatever it was for just a penny? Don't misunderstand, the deal was unbeatable on the surface, yet when you had a bunch of people exploiting the system by either creating fake identities or blatantly avoiding payment for the albums priced at full rate, and on the flip side, you had a corporation that seemed to be squeezing every penny out of miners. It really makes you wonder who's to blame in this situation. Here's a little tidbit of information I found amusing. In the year 2000, 60-year-old Joseph Parvin was arrested for an insane crime. From 93 to 98, he acquired nearly 27,000 CDs through more than 2,000 fraudulent accounts and 16 P.O. boxes, essentially defrauding Columbia House and its competitor BMG of products worth $425,000. This guy would go then sell this stuff at flea markets. It revealed that someone had indeed managed to outsmart the system in a way many only fantasized about. Now, I am not saying what he did was right, but for all of the people out there who thought it was funny to receive the initial CDs and then never pay, this guy just took it to a distribution-sized operation. I found some interesting threads on Reddit that shed some light on the experiences with Columbia House. Let's check it out. I think I still owe $25 for a CD I never ordered in 2001 or 2002. It still arrived in the mail anyway, and it was from a genre I despise, country western, which I never checked off in the preferences. I think they would send people shit albums that did not sell and hope for payment. Columbia House was never about selling CDs. They had a list of people who were willing to buy items through the mail. And the people on the list confirmed their address and info was correct every single month when you sent back that card. In those days, that data was worth gold. Your information was then sold to every mail order company they could. You were the product. The CDs were irrelevant. Looking back, Columbia House wasn't without its merits, especially when it came to music discovery in the pre-streaming era of the 80s and 90s. Before the age of AI and personalized playlists, finding new music that resonated with you wasn't as easy. Columbia House filled that gap, serving as a valuable resource for exploring different genres and artists we might not have stumbled upon otherwise. 
But echoing the concerns raised earlier, there's a flip side worth considering. Columbia House had an arsenal of usable data on their subscribers, from basic details like names and addresses to more detailed insights into music preferences, which could identify general demographics and spending habits on premium priced albums. This level of detail was incredibly appealing to random companies on the lookout for targeted leads, making subscribers information a commodity in itself. This practice of sharing or selling data raises questions about privacy and ethics of using personal information for marketing purposes. While Columbia House provided a unique service for music discovery, the way they handled and potentially capitalized on subscriber data is a reminder of the broader implications and responsibilities companies have when it comes to protecting and respecting consumer privacy. Well, that sounds dirty. In many ways, the real losers in the music club era weren't the consumers, but rather the recording artists. As the popularity of record clubs like Columbia House escalated, the allure of introductory offers became a cornerstone of their business model. However, these promotional records were often classified as giveaways by both the clubs and the labels, meaning artists didn't earn royalties on them. Moreover, when it came to regular purchases through these clubs, the royalties paid to artists were significantly lower than industry norms. This issue became particularly intense during the CD boom of the 90s. Record clubs not only sold a massive volume of albums, significantly contributing to the sales figures of hit records, but they also pressed their own CDs. This meant that while artists saw diminished royalties due to the club's pricing structures and royalty agreements, Columbia House and similar entities profited immensely from the low production costs and high sales volumes, compounded by the reduced royalty payouts. Additionally, many consumers raised concerns about the quality of the CDs from these clubs, suggesting they were inferior to retail versions, further indicating that while Columbia House was saving costs on production, the artists were really the ones paying the price. In 2005, Columbia House was acquired by its chief rival BMG Music Service following the merger between Sony Music Entertainment and Bertelsmann Music Group. This acquisition reflected the declining fortunes of record clubs, which had been losing steam for a decade. By 2008, BMG Music Service evolved into yearmusic.com, dropping the famous introductory deals but still requiring monthly CD purchases. However, the platform struggled and eventually was shut down by its parent company, Direct Brands Incorporated. The saga didn't end there. In August of 2017, a nationwide class action lawsuit was filed against DBI for various alleged malpractices, including unauthorized credit card charges and impossible cancellation policies. This lawsuit highlighted the lingering issues of a business model that was once innovative, but eventually became a source of consumer frustration. Despite its controversial end involving scams and discontent among consumers and artists, the record club model was a groundbreaking marketing strategy that revolutionized music consumption. It introduced the concept of getting music for free, sowing the seeds of its eventual decline as digital music became the norm. Yet for those who experience its heyday, it remains a nostalgic memory of a time when signing up for a club to get music felt like the best deal out there marking an era of excitement and innovation in music distribution. If you have a fun Columbia House story, please share it with us in the comments section below. I would love to hear all the crazy fun you all had with this. If you'd like to continue the conversation, go on and join my Patreon to access behind-the-scenes content and after-filming commentary sessions. It's the easiest way to connect with me directly and support the channel simultaneously. If you enjoyed the video and want more, make sure to steal from the like button. Subscribe to the channel because we are on the road to 50,000 subscribers and we're getting closer each day. And of course, ring the bell to get notified every time a new video is born. With all that said and done, friends, I'll see you on the next one. Take care.